The Innovators Network. This is Killer Innovations, a show about ideas, creativity, and how you can innovate. Welcome to the Innovators Garage, where you learn to create your next game-changing killer innovation. Welcome to Killer Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We are, again, here in the studio as we come up to wrapping up the end of 2020. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm kind of anxious to get past 2020 and to get to 2021 with everything that's been going on. Now, uh, as I look back over the year, it's been kind of a an interesting year given COVID and everything else that's going on. Uh, it has actually allowed me to do more work in the studio than I would normally be able to do, which means we've been producing regular weekly videos uh, of the episode. So you can hop on over to uh, the Innovators Network, which is the the distributor for for the show, along with uh, you can hop on over to my personal YouTube channel, Phil McKinney. Uh, the Phil McKinney channel has all of the historical videos, uh, all across the entire uh, legacy of the uh, of the show. So uh, last week we did the show as standing. We're doing it again this time. We I, actually I liked it. Like it kind of gave me an opportunity to move around versus kind of just sitting in a chair for. Uh, the 42 minutes of content that we produce um, for the radio show. So this time I am actually standing in the studio. So if you're listening to the podcast or you're listening to this on radio, sorry about that. Hop on over and uh, grab the video and you can actually see what I'm talking about here. So this week's show. Now, this week is going to be unique, so stick with me here. Uh, we have some big announcements to make on the future of this show and where we're taking this. So uh, one of the things that we've talked a lot about this show is the need to continuously look and reevaluate and innovate. If you get stuck in a rut, you get stuck doing something the exact same way for long periods of time, uh, then you're really not innovating. You're not pushing yourself to try new and different things. Uh, this is a challenge within organizations who get their innovation processes in place, and then they just want to kind of lock it down and stay in that one uh, little uh, approach and just do it, you know, uh, over and over and over again. As soon as you stand still, you are stuck in a rut. So. We're going to apply that philosophy to this show, to the Killer Innovation Show. So, one of the, what I'm going to announce today is today is the last episode of Killer Innovations as a radio show. We've been on radio since July of 2016. Uh, it's been a great experience, but today is our last episode as a nationally syndicated talk radio show. Now, this decision has not come easy. Um, I actually, we, we, I've learned a lot doing the radio show. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, it, it's been great for us. But as part of our drive to innovate and to change, it requires that you have to stop doing something to free up that bandwidth to go do something else. So rather than me just hounding on this, I'm going to live this. We're going to live it starting in 2021. So today, this episode it will be the le very last episode of Kill Innovations as a nationally syndicated talk radio show. Now, if you're listening to this on the radio, on one of our uh, affiliate stations, uh, know that, you know, it's nothing to do with the stations or biz talk radio our syndicator it's just us wanting to try something new and i'm going to use this show to explain kind of the history of the podcast and what the podcast has spun up um, as other benefits or other things that we have done radio being one of those and give you a little bit of insight of looking behind the scenes so i know what you're asking now 
So what does this mean? Is the show still going to be around? What's going on? We are going to go to a new format starting in that first week of January for the Killer Innovation Show. We are going to go to a new, back to a pure podcast format, and I'll share a little bit more of that later in the show. So the show is not going away. We are just no longer going to be producing the show uh, for radio. So the nationally syndicated um, distribution and availability of the show on radio will go away. And again, if you are listening to this on radio, you can still get the show. You can hop over, listen to iHeart, Spotify, um, Apple uh, Podcast app, Google's Podcast app. Um, you name it. We've been around forever, so you you can be you'll be able to find the show. Just search for Kill Innovations or search for Phil McKinney. But starting in January, we will be returning to being a pure podcast show which gives us a huge amount of flexibility in the format. Now, this opens up some great opportunity for us to be a lot more creative, to be a lot more innovative in the format and in the structure. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we learned at uh, having done uh, radio for four and a half years. What does that really mean um, from the standpoint of us and? Uh, what we've learned and what do we want to do um, in the show going starting uh, into next year. Now, however, this also leaves a number of questions unanswered. Now, a number of you have sent me emails on questions of wanting to learn about, you know, nationally syndicated talk radio shows and how are they structured and how do you do a deal and How do you uh, produce the show and those types of things? So I've collected up kind of a a set of those questions, and I'm going to answer those um, in the process of explaining kind of where we came from, where we are today, and where we are going. So those those particular uh, questions include, so how did I get, how did I, Phil McKinney, get my radio deal? Um, And did the book deal play a role. I'm going to give you the timeline of the podcast, my publishing deal for my book, and then ultimately the radio show. And asking how important was the podcast and putting all of this together to give me a platform. And how does radio syndication work? I had to learn it. When I got approached to do um, the radio show back in, uh, you know, 2016, uh, it I had no experience with it. I'd been on radio. I'd appeared on a number of radio shows uh, around the country, either dialing in, or I remember one crazy night at at the WGN station in Chicago, my first, you know, big um, uh, press kind of uh, appearance. I was on that show for almost an hour um, and got to see a little bit behind the scenes, but that's 20 years ago. But I had to learn everything about what is nationally syndication work. How does it structure? How do you structure the deal? What's a good deal look like? All of that. Um, And then the same question is, what does a typical book deal look like? Now, when I got my book deal to what book deals today look like, radically different. But I can give you some insight into the book deals. And then what would I recommend for others? Would I recommend you doing um, a radio show? Would I recommend you doing a podcast? Would I recommend you doing a book deal? Think about this as your media platform. It's a platform for your brand, whether that is a personal brand, you, or whether that is a, a brand for your organization, your team, your project, your organization, your nonprofit. Um, These are all media platforms. In order for you to get out there to tell your story, share your message, build up your followers, get your followers uh, excited about what it is you're doing, get them to support you, whether that's simply, um, uh, you know, uh, being a fan to financially supporting you. So this the all of these things the podcast the radio show the book deal etc are, are all part of a media platform and for me though the motivation is different 
Um, I don't make money on the deal. In fact, I've written so many checks, and <laughs> if I ever total it all up, I'd probably have a heart attack about how much I've spent um, over the years. But that was not my objective. My objective in doing all of this was to pay it forward. Some great mentors, some great influences over the years invested their time into me. This was my opportunity to share that with you. So my motivation is different than what 99.9% .9 of the people out there who do write books and do radio shows and do podcasts. I'm, I, I put myself in a little bit of a different bucket. I'm different because of the fact of what my motivation is. But what I've learned in the process, I want to share with you throughout the rest of this show so that you can learn and you can make the decision if it's right for you for what it is you want to personally achieve. So don't go anywhere. We're going to have a great show. We'll talk more about what we're doing when we come right back. Well, welcome back to Innovations. I'm your host, Phil McKinney. We are uh, here in the studio. Uh, you listen to the first segment, you heard me make the announcement that this today, this specific episode will be the last episode of Kill Innovations as a nationally syndicated talk radio show. And I'm going to walk you through kind of the history of the podcast, the book deal, the radio show deal, and then what are we looking to do in the future that's different. As I've said many times, you have to innovate. You have to be willing to do things differently. You have to be willing to try and experiment. If you get into it where you just do the same thing every day, every week, every year, and you get that self, you get yourself into that rut, you are not innovating. You are not changing. You are not doing what we talk about every week here on this show. So, with that, let's talk a little bit about the podcast history. So. Uh, some of you may be, you may be a new time listener, you may be a long time listener, but one, just bear with me, give you a little bit of history here. So the podcast was launched in March of 2005. Yes, that's right, 2005. So we've been over 15 years, we are now in season 16 of the podcast. In fact, it is the longest continuously produced podcast in history. That's right. We have stuck it out. I get, I guess I get extra credit points for tenacity, for grit. But Killer Innovations is the longest continuously produced podcast in history. Back in March 2005, there were very few podcasts. There was a small group of, of the early uh, people. I keep reminding people that we were podcasting before iTunes. Um, I've got listeners who aren't 15 years old. I've been podcasting before they were born, um, and it's been great. Love it. I love doing the podcast. And we've averaged probably forty-five. Oh, I don't know to to uh, you know fifty uh, you know fifty episodes per year. Now, as I shared in the last segment, the motivator for this: why did I do the podcast? Why did I start it back in two thousand and five? Well, I actually thought about it long before that, but the technology and the Distribution means didn't exist. The impetus for the podcast came from when a conversation years and years and years before this that I had with Bob Davis, my mentor. Uh, Bob hired me really in what I would call my first real job. I've talked about him in a couple of previous shows where I've talked about how I built up my innovation confidence and the role that Bob Davis and Rock D. Westfall and a number of other early uh, executives invested their time in me. And when I was having a conversation with him about how do I pay it back? How do I pay you back for all that time? He laughed. He goes, yeah, you can't pay it back. You've got to pay it forward. So the podcast, when I started in 2005, was following reading some articles and some very geeky technical um, sites around this thing called an enclosure tag that was invented in the RSS, which allows you to put media, blah, 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 blah. That's the underlying technology that enables podcasting. I hopped on it, but back then there were no tools. I had to hand code it every week for every show. 
But let me tell you, it was a big, big lift back then. Now, anybody can do a podcast. It's, pr- it's pretty darn simple. But what is interesting, though, is, is what the podcast then launched. So the podcast was launched in March of 2005. Then, then I got my book deal following that. So what's the history of the book deal? The history of the book deal was that I was approached by my agent, Mark Durald, out of New York in early 2010. In fact, one of his staff was a listener of the podcast and went to Mark and said, hey, this guy's got an interesting podcast. He's been doing it for quite some time. He's got some great content. I think there's a book in it. Mark called me. I just happened to be in New York. We ended up meeting for lunch, had a great conversation. Mark has been my agent ever since. So we worked on a book proposal. We distributed that in fall of uh, 2010. Um, Nine publishers uh, expressed interest. And I'll talk a little bit later about how the actual deal got done. I signed the book deal at the end of 2010, October of 2010, October, november I had finished writing the book June of 2011, and the book was released in February of 2012. The content in the book basically came from the podcast. Um, Now, I didn't just transcript it and put it over. There was a team, if you want to read about it, there's a whole part back in the dedication explaining how the whole process worked. So this is not transcripts from the shows, but the shows played the impetus. It played the impetus also for um, the structure uh, of the book deal itself. And so, um, you know, that, so the podcast led directly to the book deal. Well, let me tell you, the heavy lift on doing that book deal, unbelievable. It, people try to tell you that doing a book deal, you know, is, is uh, oh, it's easy. Just sit down, you just crank out words. It, it is not, let me tell you. It is a big big lift. I'll talk a little bit about that in in the next segment when I talk a little bit more about how the deal um, actually got structured. So then what's the history of the radio show? What what does the radio show history look like? Well, I got approached by BizTalk Radio in 2015. It was actually uh, at a trade show where I was uh, speaking. They came up and said, hey, we've listened to your podcast. Uh, We've read your book. We've seen you speak. We think that you would make you have an interesting radio show. So we had a series of conversations, um, and we launched the show July 8th of 2016 on BizTalk Radio. BizTalk Radio is a syndicator. They take individual shows, rack and stack them up, and then distribute those out to AM and FM radio stations. Um, the first year of the show, I did the show live every Sunday. I had to be in the studio at a very specific time. I had to be synchronized with the commercials. I had an engineer talking to me in my ear, like, all of that. And let me tell you, it was crazy. Uh, we moved to a pre-recorded show in 2017 where I pre-record the shows. It's all pre-arranged, and then it just gets delivered out to the radio stations. And some of the radio stations have actually preferred that because then they can put my show into the slot that has the best audience. So a number of them, like uh, stations on the West Coast, move my show around a little bit. And then today will be the last episode. December 27th, 2020 will be the last episode on, on as a nationally syndicated talk radio show. So I can tell you that the, the lineage is, has been the podcast, is the base, is the foundation. Off of that foundation, I was able to successfully secure the book deal, and I was successfully able to secure um, the radio deal. And I'm not anybody special. You probably have great content. You probably have a story to tell. You probably have some great information that you can do the same thing. And I'm here to tell you, you can do it. In the next segment, I'm going to give you some more details about how the deals are are got structured. So don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back after this quick commercial break. Welcome back to Innovations. As we continue this conversation about the changes that are happening for this show, as I've announced. Uh, earlier in the show, today will be the last episode 
of Killer Innovations made available as a nationally syndicated talk radio show. Starting in January of 2021, we will be a podcast-only format for the show. But before we exit out, I wanted to give you all some insight into how to structure these kinds of media deals. My, I've had a very successful book deal. I've had a very successful uh, radio, nationally syndicated radio deal. Um, and I can't do this all by myself. One, I've got a great team behind me here working on the, uh, on the Kill Innovation show. Uh, Andrew Passport is the associate producer. If you've been a guest on the show, you know Andrew. He's the one who schedules, uh, works with publicists, et cetera, to get guests on the show and schedules all that. Andrew also oversees the actual release of the podcast on Tuesdays. Uh, Kirk Nelson um, does all of the media work, video work, the audio work, et cetera, um, and has uh, been a, a great resource in, in helping us as we've you know, as we've as we've done more and more media related to to the show, Mark Vericcioni, who's the CEO at the the Innovators Network, who's the actual distributor of the show, uh, and not just my show. We also have Tech Pinions. We have Kim McNicholas. You know, we're, we're building up a, a catalog of shows available um, via the internet in the Innovators Network, um, and they actually then oversee all of the uh, the distribution. Um, and none of all those relationships, none of that changes. It will be the same team doing the work. But I want to give you some insights into how the deals are structured. So let's talk first about the book. Because remember, podcast was first, then it came the book. So let's talk about the structure of the book deal. As I said before, there was nine publishers who bid on the book. After the book proposal was done, Mark Gerald sent it off to publishers. Uh, nine publishers came back and, and were interested in the book. Nine bid on the book. I spent a week in New York City meeting with all of them um, and uh, uh, met with them, answered their questions. They got to meet me. And then all nine won, were still interested. So then it's what's called goes to auction. And there's a, a very weird auction process whereby in a one-week period, every morning they submit their bid. The lowest one or two uh, bids get dropped off, and then Tuesday, you're into another round of bidding. So by Friday, you know who your publisher is going to be. So it's kind of a weird structure to uh, how books are auctioned. It's very compressed, and basically every day the publisher has to submit their bid for your book, and then whoever's on the low one on the list, they get knocked off. Uh, Hyperion won the worldwide rights. They uniquely bid on the worldwide rights. Most book publishers will only buy North American rights um, and then see how the book does, and then they want to come back and then negotiate for worldwide. Hyperion, which at that time was still owned by Disney, uh, bid for the worldwide rights. Um, I committed to doing 75,000 words. I had eight months to do it in. I didn't realize how big of a hurdle that was going to be. Um, the author's advance is paid in stages. So it is paid in uh, by, uh, by deliverables. You can think about it if you're used to project management. So the certain amount got paid up front. Certain amount got uh, made of it was paid out um, when you submitted your manuscript. And then so much got paid out at the point of publication when the book um, became uh, available. The advance I was paid was very, very generous. I mean, it was like very generous. Um, and I recognize though that in the time that I did this in 2011, the book publishing industry is different than what it is today. Getting large, you know, six figure advances just is not um, a reasonable expectation in today's world. So um, I, I count me lucky. I got the timing right on, uh, on the advance. Uh, the publisher gets paid back first. The money you get is in advance against royalties. It's against the expectation of how much royalties this book will generate. So um, once you get that advance, the, the publisher keeps all the money that comes in 
until they get paid back the advance and the cost of producing the book back, then you start collecting your uh, your royalties above and beyond your advance. Um, Hyperion resold it into five countries, so you could find my books in Japanese and Chinese, Russian, Portuguese, and I'm missing one off the top of my head. Um, in fact, it was a recently a, a somebody in Brazil who uh, got a copy of the book in Portuguese and posted a, a series of uh, comments and pictures of the book and that. And uh, to be quite honest, I've never received a copy of the Portuguese. I'm supposed to get a copy of it in every language. I never got the Portuguese. Um, the publisher took control of the audiobook. That was part of the deal. So I know a number of you got really mad at me because you bought the audiobook, and it's not my voice. It's a professional voice actor. Uh, the voice actor who did mine did a great job. He actually does uh, a lot of uh, Clancy's uh, spy novel books, and he's very, his voice is very well known in, on Audible books. And he did a great job on my book, but a number of you sent me nasty gram emails because you got the audio book, you're expecting to hear me, and you didn't hear me. You heard somebody else. Uh, and then the paperback. The paperback has not been released. There is a paperback trigger that I can execute, which then either forces the publisher to issue the paperback, or I get my rights back, and I can publish the paperback. I have not done that as of yet. Let me give you go right into the structure of the radio show. So Biz Talk Radio, as I said before, is a syndicator. Now this was in the so now you're talking 2015, 2016. Um, Biz Talk had the limited exclusive rights. They were the syndicator to radio. So I couldn't go around them and go directly to a station. I did everything through Biz Talk, which is fine. I don't have any relationships in that network, in the, in in that industry. Um, it's distributed as part of their service. They sell syndicated shows to AM and FM radio stations all over the United States. So that is um, uh, the structure. Uh, some of the constraints we have to operate on with a nationally syndicated show. We must comply with FCC rules, such as political messaging, letting politicians come onto the show, uh, profanity, um, appropriateness for age, all those kinds of rules. So you have to be familiar with FCC rules to do uh, radio or get ready with the bleep button. Um, and then you must produce the shows based on the clock. So every show has a clock. In this case, BizTalk Radio has a master clock. So if you listen to BizTalk Radio shows other than mine, you know that the structure is pretty much the same. They are four-segment shows. The first segment is 10 minutes and 30 seconds. The second segment is 8 minutes and 20. Third segment is 10 minutes and 20 seconds. And the fourth segment is 7 minutes and 40. Uh, I've been doing this a long time. I know the segment times and links by heart. But you have to fit in those time slots because they're going to go to commercial break. That's how the radio stations make money. Uh, the producer, in this case myself, or the Innovators Network, pays BizTalk. There's a weekly fee you pay to the syndicator to distribute the show. Now, in this case, the producer, myself, or the Innovators Network, makes money on the ad spots. And as part of their syndication deal, you get so many minutes of national ad spots. And then it's your job to go sell those ad spots. Um, I had four one-minute national ad spots. We weren't looking to make money. And in fact, those four one-minute ad spots, we gave away to charity. We gave away to hacking autism, uh, Pioneer Education, Make-A-Wish Foundation, a whole variety of them. We never used the four-minute national ad spots for ourselves to make money. Now, how did, you know, what happened? How does this get supported? Well, Zoom actually funds um, part of the show production, right? Eric Ewing, the founder at Zoom, everybody should be familiar with Zoom with COVID. They've been a sponsor of the show for six years, five years, six years now. And Eric and I are friends. He funds the show so that we could give away those PSAs, give away those national ad spots. 
When I come back, I'm going to share with you the lessons learned on all of this and why we're changing. So don't go anywhere. We're going to be right back. Welcome back to the show. Again, this is, I know, an interesting, maybe a little different show than we've done in the past uh, because of the announcement we're making. This will be the last show we do with a nationally syndicated talk radio show. And as we move uh, to being a podcast only format. So let me share with you the lessons learned in creating my media platform, the podcast the book, and the radio show. So what are some of the lessons learned that I would give you if you were thinking about wanting to create your own media platform? One is, is do what you love. You got to love this. Look, I've been doing the podcast for 15 years. We're in season 16. Season 17 will kick off in March. We're going from radio back to a podcasting only format. Um, if I didn't love this, you don't hang around doing this for 15 years if you didn't love doing it. Um, there's been a lot of people who've gotten into podcasts and they've gone away. They 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 don't have the the wherewithal to stick with it. Um, so do what you love, right? If you love audio, do podcasting. If you love video, do YouTube. There's some great YouTube people out there that, that you can tell they just love doing it, right? The other piece is do not do it for the numbers. I can't tell you how many times I get contacted by people saying, I've launched this podcast, but I've only got 175 listeners. and It's only adding up to maybe two or three a week. And I, I need to get to a million. How do I, you know, if, if you're being driven by this, by your number, then you're not going to stick with it because the numbers are hard to get. Um, and look, even this show, we've been around for so long, but it's not like I'm competing with Tim Ferriss on downloads. Tim's got me by digits, you know, orders of magnitude, not more, because I know that my content is a little niche. There's not as many people interested in this content than uh, a Tim Ferriss's content uh, as, as an example, right? Do not do it for the numbers. Don't be constantly checking your download numbers. Don't be constantly checking your new subscriber numbers. You will drive yourself crazy. And be open to the possibilities. If you try something, you want to try a different format, you want to have a maybe a guest that's a little different than what you've had or have a guest where you've never had a guest on, try it. Be open to the possibilities. Be willing to experiment. Believe me. If it's really good, you'll hear about it. If it's really bad, you'll hear about it. And let your listeners, let your your followers help you kind of find the thing that works for you. And also, not everything will be fun, but it will be necessary. You know, in the early days, I did everything. I did all the audio editing. I did everything. Scheduling the guests, booking it, recording it, editing it. Getting, you know, doing all the little ooms and ahs and deletions and graphics. And I did everything. And then eventually I said, you know something, now that I've done it, I need to teach others and let them do it. So now I've got a staff that just does the podcast that I pay, that gets paid by the sponsors, in this case, Zoom, to produce the show. Right. And know when to walk away. Know when you've done something, you've tried it, you learned something, and you're walking away. In this case, we've made the, the hard decision to walk away from the nationally syndicated talk radio show. I've enjoyed it. It's been great. But it is also fairly restrictive. It is fairly, you got to fit it in. You got to fit it into the clock. You got to, you know, it's, you don't have quite the flexibility that you have in the podcast. So my recommendations is podcast is a great means to communicate. If you've got a story to tell, go out there and tell your story. But a podcast is hard work. Just don't think you're going to sit down in 10 minutes, whip out a recorder, and off you go. I spend anywhere from 6 to 12 hours preparing the content for a one-hour show every week. I usually get up at 5.30 in the morning, and I do that five days a week in preparation of the script. So it's five days a week hour and a half or so every day 
to two hours every day to get ready to record, and I record typically on Saturday. Uh, look seriously at self-publishing a book. I'm not sure you would go to a book publisher like I, you know, like I did. Those deals just don't exist anymore. I love doing radio, but found the clock format very controlling. Having to inter interrupt an interview mid-stride just doesn't work. Um, having to say, excuse me, we'll be right back. Let's continue our thought after the commercial break. Just doesn't work for me. I just found that very, very restrictive. Use your podcast as a starting point for other media. Be open to other media. Look at other media. Look at what you can do and see where you can take that, that content. But put your, put it, make your commitment. If you're going to go into podcasting, commit to it and do it. Do it for years. Do it regularly. I've done 45 to 50 shows a year every year for 15 years. So you've got to commit to it. So, what are we announcing? January 20 of 2021, we're updating the format. The updating the format is, will be a podcast-only format. It'll have a new format and structure, so you got to listen in on January to hear it. And we'll actually be experimenting. We're going to try a couple things early on in the year, looking for your feedback. Zoom will still be the sponsor. I can't speak highly enough of Zoom. One, what they did during COVID, but the impact that they've had. Um, on us. Um, there'll be no interruptions during interviews. So when we have guests on, we'll just talk, 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 talk until the show ends and we're done. Um, we will be expansion of the on the road shows. So they'll be traveling um, in the bus, uh, doing shows out and about. That will be expanding. We will stay as a weekly. And the length, we're going to shorten the length up a little bit to 20 to 30 minutes. We feel that that kind of maybe fits into your slot of all the podcasts you're listening to. So that's what we're going to uh, do. So that is what we are going to be uh, working on um, and uh, and getting ready for, uh, you know, the future for the show. And so uh, what I would encourage you is if you are listening to this on radio, go over and check out, um, get us set up over either on iHeart or Spotify. Um, I want to express my Deep appreciation to BizTalk Radio. They've been a great syndicator, been very supportive, taught us a lot. The radio stations have been great to work with. They have taught us a lot. I think radio has a great opportunity. We are just looking to innovate to see what we can do differently. You never know. We might come back to radio um, at some point in the future. But for right now, we're going to put radio on the back burner and focus on the new format for the show. Check us out in January. And we'll talk to you real soon. Bye-bye. This show is distributed by the Innovators Network. For more information and other great shows and content, visit theinnovators.network.